the Lord be with you. I welcome you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is Reformation Sunday. If you didn't wear red, don't feel too bad, but I love the red to look out into the congregation and see that sea of red. Every Reformation Sunday in Pentecost, we wear red. I think those are the only two where we do a special color, right? Right? Just a couple announcements for us before we begin. Uh, A special thank you for everybody who helped organize or participated in In As Much Day yesterday. We had over 60 people out there. We'll share pictures so everybody can see, but we had a lot of people out there being the hands and feet of Jesus from our community. Thank you all. All Saints Sunday is next week. All Saints Sunday is a Sunday where we remember those who have passed in the last year or people who have died before us that we hold close to our hearts forever. Next week, there'll be a table up here for you to be able to bring and share a photo of a loved one. You can bring more than one photo, more than one person. Um, We'll make sure that we find space and organize it so that uh, we can remember those who have passed before us. But those who that Jesus Christ tells us, we will be with again. We have an annual meeting coming up. I hope you got an email from me. Uh, We have an annual meeting coming up. You'll learn more about that. And we have a Q&A next week in the fireside room on the spending plan or the budget. You have the complete detailed spending plan slash budget. Um, as a nonprofit, we just call it a spending plan. We don't have budgets in nonprofits. Um, but we'll meet in the fireside room during the uh, Sunday school hour. Deb, our church council president, she has an update for us. Every time our council meets, we like to bring at least three bullet points for you so that you know what's going on as a church. Good morning. Good morning, Deb. Um, Just as far as our 2024 budget, we are right on track, so everything is looking really good for that. Um, St. Luke is hosting a Thanksgiving dinner on Thanksgiving Day from 11 to 1. Um, Please check the Making Waves or contact Carrie Oz directly about uh, how can I help details. She did share with me that a few more volunteers are needed for setting up and cleaning up. And this is the first time St. Luke is going to be one of those hosts. And um, it's a very important community outreach, so all hands on deck, Mm. if you can. As Pastor mentioned, um, our our meeting will be um, on... uh, services between between services on 9 9 15 a.m sunday november 17th um pastor our treasurer tyler constable and i will be available for a q a between services next week great thank you thank you and uh stewardship team has an announcement too josh thank you for being on the team and for sharing this morning with us Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I know I'm not Dave, but uh, the glasses might give it away, so just bear with me. (laughs) Uh, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody that submitted your intent cards. Uh, We do have 80 uh, families that have submitted theirs. Um, We appreciate that, and we just ask, um, we're still looking for another 143 families to submit. Uh, You can either do that through giving through the offering plate um, online, or you can talk to uh, myself or anybody from the stewardship team. Um, and we can help uh, you guys figure that out. Um, We're still looking for a strong response, excited about our calling for 2025, uh, and still looking for that volunteer coordinator to help us uh, um, get back to the community and uh, give back globally as well. Um, If you have any other questions, just see us, uh, Pastor, or anybody from the stewardship team. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Everything that you need this morning for worship is printed in your bulletin. Please rise as you are able. And I draw your attention to the baptismal font for the affirmation of baptism. Dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism as we come before God to make public affirmation of baptism into Christ. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you that you have made us your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called us to yourself, enlightened us with the gifts of your spirit, and nourished us in the community of faith. Uphold us and all your servants in the gifts and promises of baptism, and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. 
Amen. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, the powers of this world that rebel against God, and the ways of sin that draw you from God? I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people, following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all of the earth? People of God, do you promise to support and pray for one another in your life in Christ? We do, and we ask God to help and guide us. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give us new birth, cleanse us from sin, and raise us to eternal life. Stir up in your people the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Please join me in singing our gathering hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Eternal light shine in our hearts. Eternal wisdom scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal compassion have mercy on us. Turn us to seek your face and enable us to reflect your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with the lesson.
Good morning. A reading from Romans, chapter 3, verse 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Jesus Christ whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. I invite the children forward for the children's message this morning. Good job. All right, I'm going to find out how much you're like me when I was growing up. When I went to church this Sunday after Halloween or on Easter morning or Christmas morning, I always had candy in my pocket. Who has candy in their pocket? One? Just one? You remember, you're like me. I always had candy in my pocket when I came to church after Halloween. It only lasted a couple days, but what were you for Halloween? Name it all out. Mel from Descendants? Yep. Um, Spider-Man. Iron Spider-Man? Yeah, I saw you. Yeah, it was a very cool. She had a bucket on her head. It was very neat. A zombie what? Zombie bride? Red from Descendants? The Rise of Red? I don't know that one. What were you? You're a policeman, police girl, or a police woman? What? Dinosaur. Dinosaur? Banana. Banana? <laughs> Nothing yet? I like the bam bam hair. You can pull that off for sure. <laughs> I, as a pastor, am almost required to be Martin Luther for Halloween. Do you know who Martin Luther is? Yeah. yeah, we hide Martin Luther in the room because Martin Luther had to hide in his life. And so we remember that he was hiding. And whenever the kids find him, They get to hide him again. I think he's back there. Ian and Rebecca, John and Sue, I think he's back there in the pews somewhere the last time I looked. If you find him, you get to rehide him. Just has to be in the sanctuary. Martin Luther, I want to teach you just a couple things about him. The first thing about him was he was a monk. So he lived with a bunch of other men and they didn't eat very well and they studied the Bible and prayed a lot and sung songs a lot. They used to get up like four in the morning and go to church, and then they'd get back up at midnight and go to church again, like all the way through the day. Right? Why would you do something like that? (laughs) He was kind of weird in that way, but he decided that he was going to be an Augustinian monk because the Augustinian monks were the only ones that ever got to read the Bible. So you know how we have, you can just pick up a Bible anytime you want now? 500 years ago, you couldn't have a Bible. You weren't allowed a Bible. And when Martin Luther got his first one, he realized it says a whole lot different things in it than what people thought it said. So even later on in his career, he realized all the other pastors, they didn't know what they were talking about. So he made this thing called the large catechism, and they made another one for the the people that was called the small catechism. 
and it said, this is what it's really teaching you. This is what it's really about, because people had come up with some pretty crazy ideas of what they think is in the Bible. Believe it or not, people still come up with crazy ideas for what they think is in the Bible. Pam, our youth director, do we have any third graders here today? You're a third grader? Two third graders? So Pam is going to share with you your Bibles so that you get one. So when we did our baptism, affirmation of baptism this morning, it says that you're supposed to have a Bible, that we're going to give you one, or your parents are going to give you one, and so we have a new updated one for you guys. Go ahead, Pam. You, you should see my Bible sometimes. It's ripped up and it's got so many notes in it. Will you hand the Bible, Phil? So that's one of the beliefs that some people think, even though it's not in the Bible. People think, oh, you can't write in the Bible. I can't highlight all the things that I like. I will tell you, you should be highlighting the things that you like. You should fold over the little edges for your favorite pages and your favorite stories. It's, you could use a bookmark too, but you don't have to treat it perfectly. You can always get a new Bible. Okay. Think if you have a stuffed animal and you love it and you take it home and you give it the first small box of something beautiful, and then after you have it for a long time, it kind of gets messy, and, but you still love it, that's like your Bible. Perfect example. Good. Let's pray. Thank you, Pam. Let's pray. Before we go back, let's pray. God, we thank you for your word in our life. We thank you for the stories that you share and help us to understand them better every time we hear them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good job, everybody. You can go back to your seats. And congregation, I invite you to rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel, 
according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Jewish people who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. Think they forgot something. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And slaves do not have a permanent place in the household. The Son has a place there forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to begin today by sharing with you a famous Buddhist tale. Maybe you've heard a version of it before. I, I hope not. It's, it's quite an interesting one. One day, a man was at work, and while he was at work, his house burned down. You see, robbers had broken in. They stole all of his precious things. They kidnapped his only son, and then out of spite, they burnt the house to the ground before they left. A couple hours later, the father got out of work and he was walking home and he saw smoke coming from his yard. He realized that his house had been caught on fire, it was burning down, and he ran as fast as he could. And there in the front yard, he found a young boy who had been burned badly. He was dead. Believing it to be his son, he buried that child. He rebuilt the house, and he was never the same because of the loss of his child. Because, you see, he didn't know that he'd only been kidnapped. Years later, that kidnapped child escaped from his captors. He ran home as fast as he could, pounded on the door of his father's new house, and said, Dad, Dad, let me in. But the father responded, Stop teasing me, you evil neighborhood kid. You know that my son is dead. For years, his son kept coming back and pounding on the door, trying to get his dad to understand. But his father, his father was unable to believe the truth. And he missed out on the best good news of his entire life. Beliefs are important. But sometimes, sometimes they can get in the way of the truth. As Lutherans, I think we know this. We know the importance of being open to new beliefs and new teachings in Scripture. Martin Luther's whole ministry was about this stuff. His reinterpretations on what grace means in Scripture changed religion. And he wasn't coming up with something new per se. He was really bringing back the beliefs of old. Directly from Scripture, from Romans 3, our first reading today, that we are saved by grace, not by our works. That salvation is what Jesus Christ did on the cross 2,000 years before we were born. And that the only thing that we bring to the equation of salvation is our need for it. When Luther realized this, he set aside his old belief in a God who delights in keeping score, who's got a checklist of you better do's and you better don'ts. He said when he realized this, that it was as if the gates of paradise had been opened up to him right here on the face of this earth. And he admitted that he had come to hate, to hate the God who he once believed enjoys punishing, a belief that hurt him for far too long in his life. And I'd like to share with you another brief story, too, about where and how and when this revelation came about for Martin Luther. Because there's a story, there's a legend that it happened in an outhouse, in a bathroom. Because Luther indeed did have a 
diet of beer and cheese and wine. It definitely took a toll on his gut, and it is well documented with his own words that he suffered from bloating and constipation. He was known to spend hours out there in the outhouse praying for relief. And the rumor goes one day he finally was relieved from that excruciating pain. And it was right then and there that he realized just how big God's grace and love for us can be. He experienced grace like never before. That legend might be true. It might not be true. But if you take a tour of Martin Luther's house, if you go to Germany, there's a good chance that your tour guide is going to take you to where that house, outhouse was supposed to be and tell you that story. Believe it if you want to. If it helps you to appreciate the truth and relate to God's love and grace, if it helps you to associate and remember what it truly feels like to have that feeling of grace, then that story is valuable for you. And it speaks the truth, even if it might not be literally true. The Bible sometimes does that too with some of its stories. Not all of them. Some of them are literally true, like Jesus resurrected from the dead. That's a literal true story. But sometimes they function like Aesop's fables, where you have the tortoise and the hare running a race. We all know that the truth isn't that one day there was a turtle and a rabbit that had a race. We took the story as it was meant to be told. We took the story to mean if you're running a race, slow and steady, will win it. The story doesn't have to be literally true to be true. If it teaches you what you're supposed to learn and it does so in a way that you're going to remember it forever, then that story has done its job in your life. As a pastor, it's my job to break down false beliefs and to help people grow into bigger, newer ones. It's the way that I've grown the most in my own faith, and I think it's only fair to share those growing pains with you all. I think I've shared this story before, but it's because it's so foundational in my own faith story. When I was taking an Old Testament class in seminary, I had a professor, Dr. Stevens, and a few times a year, she'd look us in the eye and walk over to the door close the door and stand in front of it and say, I have something that I need to tell you that's the truth about the Old Testament, but you're not going to like it. It's going to challenge everything you believe, but you can't leave. You need to struggle with it and come to the truth. And I learned there that every single time that that rug gets pulled out from underneath of us, and that doesn't feel good, but every time that rug of our false beliefs gets pulled out from underneath of us, we get closer to the foundation of our faith, to Jesus Christ himself. It's one of my hardest tasks. It's the place where I probably take the most grief as a pastor, unchallenging long-held beliefs. But I do it because sometimes we come to church with a faith that's just not true something that we've made up that is counter to what Scripture actually tells us. There are lots of damaging beliefs in Christian thought. There are some that think that God created most people to rot in hell forever, except for the lucky few that passed the test. That's the God that Luther hated. That's a belief that turns our good creator into the devil himself. There's a belief in many churches around our country that believe in white Christian nationalism, that that is God's plan for the world, that Christians, and white Christians in particular, they are the ones with the best culture and the right beliefs. Everybody should just, should just be like me. That teaching comes from politicians. Politicians with agendas to manipulate you, it does not come from Scripture itself, because you know what isn't in the Bible? The white nationalists? What isn't in the Bible? White people. It's a brown people's story. 
There's another belief that hurts us and it hurts our kids. That we should better hurry up and destroy all of the natural resources and use them as fast as we can so that we can get Jesus to come back just a little bit sooner. In that mentality, famously, Ann Coulter said about the earth, take it, rape it, it's yours. It's the idea of destroying God's good creation as fast as we can so that we can manipulate Jesus, so that we can manipulate God to come back sooner. A terribly dangerous and unbiblical belief. And then there's the one that I complain about all the time. That people teach that it's the good people who have the good life. That God rewards faith with worldly things. The reason that you have so many good things in your life is because you're a good, faithful Christian. This morning, Joel Osteen's on TV right now holding up that belief. It's called the prosperity gospel. And it goes against everything that Jesus ever taught us about picking up our cross and suffering as servant disciples like he did. But people like to buy what we want to hear. Even if it's the exact opposite of everything that Jesus ever taught us about servant life. The truth is there are much bigger and better beliefs out there in the gospel than some of those that we have just settled on. And Jesus tells us that the truth will make us free. But in settling for these false and easy beliefs, we may have actually missed out on the truth. The good news is that Jesus, Jesus invites us to find the truth in him. It is Jesus who comes to us even today to heal our spiritual blindness. Jesus continues to teach us as his disciples, and we all, all have more to learn. Every one of us has things that we still need to grow into. And as people of faith, we're supposed to grow. But we're supposed to grow in the right ways. As St. Paul says, early young Christians, the Sunday school Christians that are still just learning, we feed them milk, the easy things to digest, the easy beliefs that might not be quite there But that milk just gets us to the point where we can grow up and finally have the real meat of our faith. The things that are the most valuable, the things that are harder to digest, but the things that we're really supposed to believe. Paul believes that we can get there. I invite you to reflect on your own beliefs and how they might damage you or even damage those that you love today or in the future. And to be okay with letting some of those false beliefs go, because every time you do, I promise you, you'll get closer to the belief in Jesus Christ, our foundation that matters. There is better news out there than what some people have settled on, and Jesus is begging for us to finally listen to him in Scripture instead of just picking out the parts that already verify what we already think. And I don't know what about you, but I don't ever want to be like that old stubborn fool in that Buddhist tale who misses out on the best news of his life. Please don't just settle on what you already believe. There is more to the truth. Amen. Please rise as you are able and join me in singing our hymn of the day.
we continue with the prayers of intercession. Challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation. Eternal Counselor, guide the church along your paths of mercy. Direct it to be a refuge where all are genuinely welcomed and their gifts are celebrated. God of grace. Amen. Eternal Nurturer, reserve natural places for rest and rejuvenation. Guide the work of conservationists, park rangers, urban planners, gardeners, and all caretakers of natural spaces. Attune us to the wonders we disregard or fail to notice. God of grace. Amen. Eternal wisdom, strengthen the, the voices of those who cry out for change to unjust systems. Give lawmakers, judges, and all those who occupy seats of power listening and compassionate hearts. God of grace. Eternal compassion, train us to respond to the cries of those in any kind of need. Give encouragement and comfort to those who call out for relief from pain, grief, or oppression. God of grace. Eternal servant, grant vision and wisdom to the church so that those who are in need are not ignored. May the command of Jesus to love our neighbors sharpen our focus for their work in the kingdom. God of grace. Amen. Eternal hope. May the legacy of the saints inspire us every day. We hold fast to the promise that we will be together in your presence forever. God of grace. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Share a sign of peace with your neighbors. We continue with our offering. Please be seated.
please rise. Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joy we praise you, gracious God. For you created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even after we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his life, death, and resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was handed over, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. To whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. Please be seated. Our ushers will guide you forward for communion this morning. Visitors know that you are more than welcome to have communion here in this place. This is Jesus' table. Will the communion assistants please meet me at the altar? Hymn number 480, O Bread of Life from Heaven.
number 597 my hope is built on nothing less the song. Please rise. And may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. God Almighty, God most merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Amen. Please join me in singing our sending hymn.
Go in peace. Follow Jesus. Thanks be to God.